another warm welcome to our Cogit uh, podcast series. Uh, my name is Anthony Richards and I'm the editorial director of Cogit. Um, the intention of this podcast series is to discuss particular themes and issues within terrorism and counterterrorism. And today's theme uh, revolves around um, the threats that ISIS and Al Qaeda um, present uh, to both European countries and uh, to the United States and what the appropriate, most appropriate responses might be to that. Now today, I'm uh, delighted to be joined by Dr. Lorenzo Bettina. He is the director of the program on extremism at George Washington University, and is a leading authority on the jihadist terrorist threat in the West. He is well known for his writings on the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Um, he wrote a book called The New Muslim Brotherhood in the West um, in 2010 with Columbia University Press. Um, and his latest book, which was published just last year, is entitled The Closed Circle, Joining and Leaving the Muslim Brotherhood in the West, also uh, with Columbia University Press. Um, Lorenzo, it's a delight to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Right. Well, um, firstly, uh, if I may, Lorenzo, um, we hear about groups associated with Al-Qaeda strengthening in the Sahel, East Africa, and the Middle East. Um, and we hear about uh, worrying ISIS presence um, in South Africa and Mozambique. Uh, how do you assess the implications of these developments and indeed the nature of the severity of the Al Qaeda and ISIS threat um, as far as Europe and the United States are concerned? Yeah, well, I think we're in a very strange transitional phase of jihadism. If we see uh, the history of jihadism, at least when it comes to the West, uh, spanning 40 years, give or take. We're in a strange phase in which we're clearly seeing the end of the Syrian Iraq dominated, ISIS dominated phase. And I think that we're sort of in a, from a jihad, from a Western jihadist perspective, we're a bit in a limbo, in a confusing time where there's no clear destination and no clear leader uh, to the global jihad. Of course, there are sympathies for for ISIS that is not gone, there's sympathy for Al-Qaeda, probably smaller, but also not gone. Uh, but in terms of what is the clear destination, if you intend to travel, which was the big feature of the previous decade, uh, there's no clear place. Um, you are talking about different locales in, in Africa, and indeed that seems to be somewhat the center of global jihadism. We have uh, a very troubling uh, uh, arch that starts from uh, the Lake Chad Basin, uh, Nigeria and neighboring countries uh, with uh, sort of ISIS affiliated group uh, to Al-Shabaab, which is Al Qaeda affiliated in Somalia and then going further south to, to the DRC and, and Mozambique. Uh, all these places are seeing very troubling developments for uh, global, from a global perspective, and definitely from a local African perspective, but none of them seems to be, uh, definitely right now, but even in the near future, seems to be attracting the kind of attention and mobilization that Syria and Iraq uh, uh, did 10 years ago. And this is for a variety of reasons that I would summarize as two mostly. Uh, one is the logistical difficulty of getting into these places, getting into Syria, getting into Iraq 10 years ago was a piece of cake. But people call it the uh, uh, easy jet jihad. You take a flight from uh, any European city in two hours, you'd be the Turkish Syrian border, and it was fairly easy to get in. It's a completely different ball game, not only because of the pandemic, irrespective of the pandemic, um, to get into parts of Nigeria or Congo or Mozambique. And the second reason is the emotional appeal. Now, there's no question that if you go on online in a variety of spaces, you will see sympathy. Uh, among Western jihadists for uh, some of the groups operating in Africa, but it's not the same kind of emotional, passionate appeal that a group having declared the caliphate in the, in the heart of the Arab world, with all the symbolism that that entails. Had. So, uh, uh, of course, we've seen a few isolated individuals trying to travel to these areas and others, Southeast Asia, Afghanistan, over the last couple of years, but nothing that resembles the, 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 the numbers that we saw in the past. So what's going to be like in the near future? I think it's very difficult to say, but I don't see any of these places um, rivaling even remotely 
what Syria and Iraq was before. And that to some degree leads to a bit of a more quiet situation uh, in Europe and North America. Uh, but it's not to say that the jihadist threat is gone, but it's not to say that there are no networks and isolated individuals that are still radicalized, still um, interested in mobilizing, whatever mobilizing means, whether it's traveling or carrying out attacks, but it doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to be the same energy that we saw a few years ago. And at the same time, it looks fairly apparent that authorities throughout the West seem to be seem to have a better grasp, better grip on, on the phenomenon. That also applies to some of the, let's call it smaller countries that maybe 10 years ago were more unprepared to deal with the threat compared to, let's say, the UK or the US, which have more of an experience to deal with it. I think some of the problems we saw 10 years ago were with countries like, uh, and I hate to single them out, but let's say Belgium, Sweden, that might not have had the same experience uh, and apparatus to deal with the phenomenon. So things are slightly better, but it's not to say the threat is gone. And we can discuss now it's evolving. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. So in terms of the homeland security and, and indeed perhaps the sort of homegrown uh, terrorist threat, uh, perhaps those inspired uh, by developments abroad, um, how, how do you assess that? Because of course, France has suffered quite a lot recently, haven't they? And um, we hear about the uh, statistics and the figures in the UK in terms of still the thousands and thousands of people of concern as far as the intelligence agencies here are concerned. Um, so do you, do, you, do you think that, you know, we, we can sort of not be as concerned as we used to be, or should we still uh, be really acutely concerned about that level of threat? I mean, I, I think it's difficult to sort of say more or less. Yeah. I would say we're not in the peak as we were in 2015, 16. I mean, if you just look at the uh, number of attacks, uh, the metrics we can use, as imperfect as they may be, because of course one can say, well, we have less attacks because the security services are better intercepting them. So uh, all the metrics need to be contextualized, but the numbers are significantly uh, lower than, than before. Although 2020 saw more attacks in the West than 2019 and 2018. So there's been a small resurgence, albeit majority of attacks have been relatively unsophisticated, sort of amateurish, uh, um, so not, not the kind of big plots uh, that we saw some, in some cases in the past. I think we're in a situation where the numbers are more or less the same. I think it would be, as a few years ago, I think it would be naive to think that the bubble of sympathy that existed for, and I say jihadist ideology, because whether it's ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or other groups, sort of the flavor of the day, and, and people that are jihadist sympathizers go often from one group or the other. But uh, the bubble of jihadist, uh, at least in the West, uh, the bubble of jihadist sympathy, it would be naive to think that it evaporated uh, with the partial demise of, of ISIS. Those networks exist, those isolated individuals that mostly radicalize online still, uh, still exist. There's less of a sense of a direction, but the numbers are, uh, are, pretty, are pretty much there. Uh, probably each country, is, of course, would, would deserve a separate analysis. But generally speaking, there's a better understanding of the phenomenon, as I said earlier. Uh, there's a better ability, there are better legal tools. Most countries change their legislation, improved it, or passed counterterrorism legislation altogether. We had some countries in Europe that did barely, did, basically did not have a counterterrorism legislation uh, un until a couple of years ago. They didn't have it when the mobilization started. I'm thinking of Switzerland, for example, that basically did not have terrorism provisions on its books uh, 10 years ago. Things have changed, more resources have been allocated, that determines a better grip on, uh, on the phenomenon, and that's why we see less attacks. Uh, again, we don't see people traveling and a better grip, but the dynamic is still there. I agree with those who say that generally the, the, what we have seen, again, taking a step back and looking at this historically in Europe, we've always seen that it, there's always a scene of individuals who adopt jihadist ideology, it's always there and it emerges, of course it grows in size when a big geopolitical event taking place outside of Europe pops up. That was Afghanistan in the 1980s, so small uh, peak of European Westerners traveling there, of course, 
relatively small compared to what we see today. Bosnia in the 90s, first invasion, so invasion of Iraq 2003 uh, in the 2000s, and then of course the uh, war in Syria declaration of the caliphate. So every sort of 10 years, that is not to say that's how it's gonna be necessarily. No. Uh, we've seen these big geopolitical events that make the bubble of jihadist sympathizers that has always existed in, uh, in the West grow in size and become more active and mobilized. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. I, I mean, all the responses, I think you, you're referring to legislation there. Um, do you think the United States and Europe in general have responded appropriately to the IAQ and the ISIS threat? Um, is this, you know, what has worked, perhaps what hasn't worked? And is there any sort of initiative or, or approach that you would have uh, suggested that hasn't been done that you think might have worked effectively? What, what's your kind of general <laughs> assessment of how the West has responded to it? It would be pretty arrogant of me to think that there is one thing that I know and all governments <laughs> don't know <laughs> if they would have uh, defeated terrorism. No, I, I, again, different countries have reacted in different ways. Uh, we can find pros and con cons in the approaches of every Western country. Um, you know, the, the US, of course, has uh, a very strong approach, which is not just enshrined in the Patriot Act, it's the material support clause, which is a very comprehensive uh, approach, which basically leads to uh, very stiff penalties, inconceivable in, the, in Europe for individuals who just provide small scale material support, which sometimes would just be uh, it would just mean translating a jihadist uh, script on uh, online, and you, you get 20 years in some cases in the States. That's so very, very harsh, but of course it is uh, leaving aside any kind of consideration uh, from a moral point of view, very effective. What the US has lacked is the preventive approach. It's what is, could be the CVE, PVE, uh, radicalization prevention, call it what you will that has de facto never really existed in the States. And I think a comprehensive counterterrorism strategy includes the two, if we want to call them the, the hard and the soft, if that's how we want to call them. And the, the, the US system has been skewed on, on the hard and lacks, for example, any uh, prison rehabilitation program, any kind of uh, um, sort of de-radicalization channel-like uh, program. Uh, there's been a lot of talk over the last 10, 15 years to try to implement something like that for one reason or the other. It's very complex, but it, it, it never got done and that it transcends any, any kind of uh, political color and administration. Uh, when it comes to Europe, uh, of course, most countries have had a more balanced approach between soft, uh, soft and hard. I, I do think, though, that in some countries, penalties are a bit soft, uh, you know, and the, you know, some of the penalties of two, three years uh, for trying to join a terrorist organization. And that leads to the phenomenon of almost revolving doors, people serving just a few months in prison, then getting out, uh, assuming a de-radicalization program can work, uh, no time to, to, to implement it. That is the case, for example, of the perpetrator of the Vienna attack last November, tried to join ISIS repeatedly, got caught, sent back to Austria, uh, sentence to a very short time, months, further reduced. Uh, and then of course, when he gets out, he's still very radicalized, very difficult to monitor, and he carries out yeah. an attack. So uh, every, every country, of course, has its own system with pros and cons. I think the balance of the two, though, is where, uh, where sort of the, the magic spot is. Thank you very much indeed. That's very interesting. Um, actually, on on uh, the US position and in terms of the lack of it, what do you what do you might call the equivalent of a prevent strategy? Um, I should note that uh, you you very kindly um, uh, produced a chapter for our volume which assessed the, where America was at in terms of countering violent extremism. And I think the sort of general conclusion was that uh, it is quite underdeveloped in the United States, perhaps compared with some countries in Europe. Um, so my next question actually is related to that, which is, um, you know, to what extent has the Biden administration, is it going to change that? And what are the differences between the approaches perhaps to countering violent extremism and counterterrorism more broadly do you envisage um, it, with these sort of, with the introduction of this new administration compared with the previous Trump administration? Uh, well, obviously the big shift uh, uh, entails the fact that the 
priority when it comes to so the ideological milieu from which terrorism comes in the state has changed significantly. Uh, and, and now it's mostly about what is known as domestic terrorism, which is a very broad term. It includes uh, militia, uh, conspiracy groups like, uh, you know, variety of groups like the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, uh, a very heterogeneous jungle of, uh, of groups and, ideo and sub-ideologies. Of course, uh, in a post-January 6th environment, that's really uh, the moment in which a lot of things change, although it was clear over the last two, three years that right-wing extremism and terrorism was becoming more and more lethal in the United States. But January 6th, of course, is a massive demarcation uh, moment. Uh, that is becoming the priority. The debate is, of course, and it gets politicized, unfortunately, as to which of the threats is bigger, domestic terrorism or what is known as uh, homegrown violent extremism, which would be basically right-wing or jihadist uh, terrorism. Uh, I'm not sure we have to get into a competition that seems to be almost a desire in, in some political quarters to uh, get into a gotcha calculation where, aha, if that one is bigger and more lethal than the other, I, I think it, it depends. We have different features. But the, when it comes to the hard part, of course, the big challenge there is that there's a, this is a, a unique American feature, in my humble opinion, not a not so great one is that it makes a substantial distinction between a foreign terrorist organization and a domestic terrorist group. So what we were talking about earlier in terms of support for a group like ISIS and Al-Qaeda, you get 20 years if you post online something uh, that furthers that group, or if you wire 50 bucks to one of these entities, you get charged for material support of a foreign designated terrorist organization. And that gives authorities enormous leeway in terms of investigation and in terms of prosecution. That system does not apply to domestic terrorism, where the laws are completely different. A lot of behaviors that are unquestionably terroristic in nature, identical to those that would be um, carried out by individuals in furtherance of, I, of jihadist ideology are not punished as terrorism. There's uh, quite a few bills being discussed in Congress uh, about remedy this situation uh, and so we'll see that might change of course it's a very political debate as you can as you can imagine that also um, to some degree uh, works for the soft part of counterterrorism for prevention Biden administration has announced uh, a new uh, entity within the Department of Homeland Security that should be doing preventive work. The term CVE has become poisonous in a US uh, political environment. So uh, the description of this new entity is very much in line of somebody with or some entity that does preventive work. It's fairly, neut fairly neutral uh, from an ideological point of view, as it should be, in my opinion, meaning that it looks at extremist uh, behaviors, irrespective of the ideology, how this new entity uh, will work, how this all new approach will be implemented. It's too early to tell. The whole thing was announced literally a few days ago. Great, so thank you very much, Lorenzo. That was very, very comprehensive indeed. Um, um, a related question. Um, to what extent should we be concerned about non-violent um, extremists when we're countering terrorism. Um, and I know you've written about this and you've sort of carried out some research on this. Um, for example, do uh, so-called non-violent extremist organizations, do you think they kind of represent a firewall against terrorism, if you like, a safety net, you know, against people going on down the trajectory towards violence? Or do you think actually conversely that they represent the conveyor belt towards terrorism? Well, what's your view on this? Because I know there's a debate about this in the literature. Yeah, it's, it's one of those two or three endless debates in terrorism studies. Uh, it's, does poverty cause terrorism? Uh, what is the role of, is it the two or three issues that, that get academics, but also policymakers and practitioners uh, to get into very heated debates. Uh, and I think when treated with nuance, I think we, we can get to some, some ideas that are probably agreed upon by, uh, by most. I think it's, uh, if not put in simplistic ways, uh, I think um, we, we can get to some common, uh, common ground. 
first of all, it depends what we mean by nonviolent Islamist groups. And by the way, the same analysis would apply to other ideologies as well. I find it, so let me open a bit of a parenthesis, but I find it relatively amusing to see that a lot of the people that for a long time have said that absolutely there is no connection between the work on nonviolent Islamist and violent ones have been very vocal in saying that what some uh, very conservative voices in the United States have been saying for a long time caused the radicalization of people who, ca who carried out the attack on January 6th, sort of created the mood music that the words of you know, President Trump, and I don't want to get into it, but if you make the argument that the words of President Trump and other people pushed people to violence, then you got to apply the very same argument for intellectual honesty. You got to apply it also to other ideology and ideologies, and so therefore it could be applicable uh, to Islamism as well. Um, and I think if we look, since we were talking about the ISIS-related mobilization in the West, uh, we did see quite a bit of evidence of a connection between nonviolent Islamism and nonviolent groups and violent radicalization. That is not to say, obviously, that everybody that is exposed or sympathizes to nonviolent Islamism will become violent. It's much more complex than that. The majority arguably will not. And there's, uh, there are many elements that contribute to whether one individual goes further in the radicalization trajectory or not. But sticking to the evidence of, and let's take as an example, the ISIS rate mobilization in, uh, in Europe in particular, uh, in 2012 onwards, uh, there's no denying that certain milieus, certain organizations, uh, uh, had a major impact in the radicalization process. Why is it that we saw, and that is applicable to every European country, radicalization hubs? So a high amount of people, let's say, traveling to Syria from town A, and a very small number, if not zero, uh, individuals traveling from town B, which has identical sociodemographic uh, characteristics. The answer often is in the work of charismatic preachers, uh, militant Salafist organizations that created sort of a, a breeding ground, a fertile environment in which it was easier for some individuals to make the leap into violence. So why is it that most of the people who left Belgium, which is one of the countries most affected by the ISIS related mobilization, most of them came from three areas of Belgium, three three towns, basically, Antwerp, Brussels, and, and Filforde, because those are the areas in which groups like Sharia for Belgium were very active. If you look at a UK setting, it's very similar dynamics. The groups of friends, the work of uh, organizations like the many spin-offs of al Mouajirun, they created those personal connections, those human chains, that led to, uh, to radicalization. Again, it's, it's not an empirical science, of course, but I think there's a consensus, I would say among intelligence agencies, that these organizations do create, do have a role in the radicalization process. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. That, that, again, that, that was very interesting indeed. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a, a real pleasure to listen to your thoughts and your expertise. So once again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, my pleasure.